2 Kings chapter 5. Let's go to verse 10. 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 10. The Bible says Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Naaman was wroth and went away. He said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and far far rivers of Damascus better than all these waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. His servant came, to, came near, spake to him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, would it now not have done it? How much rather than when he said to thee, Wash and be clean. Then he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. You may be seated. I want to take my thought from verse 10 tonight. The Bible says, And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times. Tonight, for a few moments, I want to preach to you on this thought. There's something in the water. There's something in the water. What we find tonight, and you're familiar with this account of the Bible, of what went on by the fella, with the fella by the name of Naaman. We sing a little song used to when I grow when I was growing up. We don't hear it much anymore. I hadn't heard it much. Except when I used to be younger, I'd get the congregation here to sing it. Naaman went down to the river and he dipped. And when the people in the church got lethargic, I'd get them out and get them to dipping. You know, when I thought they got settled in the pew, we'd sing Naaman went down. They thought I was just being simple and foolish. But I was getting them to move. I was getting that oxygen stirred up in their body so they wouldn't go to sleep. Because they were on a countdown to a nap. Naaman went down to the river and he dipped. Naaman went down to the river and he dipped and he dipped and he dipped and he dipped and he dipped. And his leprosy was all washed away. It seems so simple, doesn't it? But there's power in the message of what happened to a pagan. Naaman was not a man of God. He had his own idols. But Naaman was fixing to come in contact with the God of gods. Naaman was fixing to be approached, moved upon by God Almighty. We know how God feels about other gods. There are no gods besides me. That's what the Lord has said. And so all the prayers, all the sacrifices, all the enchantments that Naaman had went through, I'm sure... That he had went through all of these things because leprosy was a serious thing in that day. Leprosy was just a, made you a social outcast. The Bible is particular to say about Naaman that he was great with his master and honorable. Because by him, the Lord had given deliverance to Syria. So Naaman was this person that had a special place and was acknowledged, promoted above and beyond this sickness that caused everybody else to be excommunicated. He was accepted. How about that? Society works that way. Society picks and chooses who they will accept and who they will discard. And they really don't have to have a reason to, I believe the words cancel you today, 
Is that still a relevant word today? Cancel culture? Oh, I'm just going to cancel you. How do you cancel me? First of all, I got to care if you cancel me. Right? And I don't care if culture cancels me. Because I canceled culture a long time ago. Amen? When Jesus saved me, the culture of my life changed. So the culture of the world became irrelevant to me. As it should have become irrelevant to you. As a child of God. Am I right or am I wrong? Do I need to sit down and go home? Or am I right? But culture has such a bearing on the house of God that today's culture has changed the function of the house of God because who we have accepted and our desire to be accepted. Do you realize today that the church age, the church world, the church as a whole has a desire to be accepted by the world even more so than it does by Christ? That's a sad statement, but that's a true statement today because there's an acceptance culture or an acceptance ideal in the lives of people that if we're going to help people, we've got to be accepted by them. But that is contrary to the teaching of the Word of God. The Word of God has called us out from the world to be different from the world To have a different attitude, mindset, a different walk, if you will, of the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. I have to mingle in the world, but I'm not to be spotted of the world. I can't cut myself off from people because people need my witness. Just as people need your witness. But they don't need you to be like them. Right? And so if we look at things today, and being we're talking about leprosy, we'll just allow leprosy to be our definition of sin tonight. The American conditioners is working. I'll check them. Just y'all breathing heavy tonight. But we find that somewhere along the line, leprosy, has affected us, it's spotted us, that we don't want to be offensive to the sin of people, that we don't want to drive people away with the offensive nature of the Word of God. Listen, sometimes people take the mindset that because the gospel is offensive to the sinner, it means that I can be offensive to people. Don't you fool yourself. God has not given you the liberty to be offensive to anyone. God has not given you the liberty to be self-righteous toward anyone. God has not given me the liberty to look at anyone and belittle them of my own accord. Because the Bible teaches us, Jesus himself said it, that there are none righteous save God. And when we present ourselves in a smug nature and we present ourselves that we're just a touch better than they are and our witness comes across that they're just dogs. You better remember you were that same dog. Too many times we forget where we come from. We forget that we were bound in that same sin. Our sins may have been different, but we were bound by the same chains of sin. And God has not allowed us to come to somebody and look at them in an irreverent manner and say, You know what? You bum, you need Jesus. And that's exactly the way a lot of church folks treat people. The prophets of old didn't treat them that way. They spoke the word of God. I want you to understand that if you look at the prophets of old in the word of God, one of the character traits of the prophets of old is they were humble. They had a boldness that come on them by the spirit of God. But they were humble men of God. Right? Elijah was backwards. 
wasn't he? Elijah, you look at Moses. God made Moses as a God to the people. And Moses had a stuttering problem. Moses had a problem talking. He had a problem being up in front of people. But the Bible says Moses was the meekest man known to man. What does it mean? It means he was humble. It was, he wasn't arrogant in his spirit. But here we got Naaman right here. There was a little bit of arrogance in Naaman. He was sick, yet he was honored. He was a social outcast, but yet he was included. And so Naaman had this entitlement about him. You listen to me tonight. I'm preaching. He had this entitlement about him. All right, I know I'm special. I'm special and I know I'm special because I've got special circumstances with the king. But Naaman was fixing to meet up with a God that didn't respect his position. I want you to understand today that God sends us out as ambassadors to win people, not to alienate people. Are you with me tonight? How many people have been alienated from the house of God? How many people have been turned away, turned off from Jesus Christ because of attitudes of church people? Because of the attitudes of the righteous? I know I talked about behavior this morning and I'm not going back to behavior. But here it is. It's right before us tonight. Amen. That the man of God said, Naaman, all I need you to do is go dip in that river Jordan and your problems will be solved. It's as simple as that. I don't care what you think about the river. I don't care how you perceive that river. It's a flowing body of water. And all I need you to do is go in that river, obey the word of God, and things will change in your life. I don't want to do it God's way. I don't want to go in that dirty, polluted river. I don't want to go in there with the animal carcasses. I don't want to go in there with the trash. I don't want to go in there with the waste. I don't want to go with all the pollutants in that river. I want to go in the rivers at home where I know those rivers are clean. Where I know there's honor and there's no worry about me contracting diseases going in that river. I want to go where I know it's clean. And the prophet was telling him, I'm telling you to go into dirty water. Was it you, Brother Frank, that testified many years ago you'd went to a tent revival? And, and you didn't press your shirt? Or you went to revival and you were in a hurry and didn't press your shirt? And God told you to take your coat off? Somebody, and I thought it was him. It may have been somebody else, but... Yeah. Was in a hurry and, you know, very particular. I mean, I, I ironed this shirt this morning. I mean, there's a crease right there. But you can't tell I pressed it now after wearing it all day. But he went there, you know, and was careful, conscientious about presentation. God said, take off your coat. If you want a blessing, take off your coat. Lord, I didn't iron my shirt. It's wrinkled. Well, you want a blessing? Or you won't let that wrinkled shirt separate you from the blessing? Took off that coat and the Lord blessed. It's no different scenario than what Naaman was facing. You want to stick with you want to go? You can dip in the river of Damascus, you can dip in the far far river all you want to. And all you'll do is come up wet. You'll go in dry and you'll come out wet, but you'll still be sick. He said, but if you'll go dip in that river Jordan, you come out, you'll be a different man. I told you tonight, there's something in the water. You want to know what was in the water? First of all, Naaman was in the water. First of all, Naaman chose to get in the water. And Naaman couldn't deep in water that was ankle deep. And Naaman couldn't dip in water that was knee deep. 
Naaman had to get in water that was waist deep or better. Naaman had to get in dirty, polluted water that was going to cover his head. You know what else was in that water? Obedience. It wasn't that anybody was stirring a magic stick. It wasn't that anybody was doing anything different or special in that water. It was just obedience to the Word of God that Naaman went down there and he said, Okay, that servant said, If it was something great, Master, you'd do it because you'd get glory from it. How hard is it for you just to go dip in a river you don't want to go dip in? Makes sense to me. And Naaman went down and he began to dip in that water. And Naaman wasn't healed because of dirty water. Naaman was healed because of obedience. Naaman was healed because he listened to the word of God. Naaman was healed because he got over that pride that was in his life. He got over that desire for glory that was in his life. And he said, hey man, I'm tired of being sick. And I'm tired of carrying this disease. And Naaman said, whatever the Lord bid me do, that's what I'm going to do. Hey man. And the Lord revealed himself to Naaman And Naaman come by What I've come to tell you tonight church uh, There is something in the water John chapter 5 tells us about a pool By the name of Bethesda And the Bible says that that water was troubled At certain times that the angel of the Lord Would come down and trouble that water And those that could get to that pool of Bethesda Amen They would be healed Uh, What was in that water? It was obedience It was faith i come to you tonight to tell you amen we're looking for something spectacular when it's all wound up in our obedience to the lord jesus christ what's hard about obedience what's hard about obedience because obedience causes us to yield Our will. Does it not? Every one of us, and it probably, I can't exclude anybody from this, when you ask someone to do something or in your position to tell somebody to do something and you give that directive for them to do it, what do you want them to do? You want them to do it, don't you? And when they don't do it, Most times you get frustrated and what happens? You do it yourself, right? And then fuss about it, right? Well, when I was growing up, I don't have no other stories to tell about this except stories when I was growing up, how it was in the house of Layton. You know, Mama would say, David, I want you to do this. And I'd say, okay, Mama, I'll do it. And I, sometimes I didn't do it right when Mama would say do it. But Mama had a magic phrase that would cause me to move with the speed of Flash Gordon. She said, I'm going to tell you, Daddy. And it just motivated me. I got it done. Anything else you want me to do, Mama? I got it done. Because I knew if my mama told my daddy that I didn't do what she said do, we was going to the house of prayer. And they was going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth. And he wasn't going to be the one that was doing it. It was going to be me crying out, Oh God, Get this man off me. And so I understood that if I would obey, it was a whole lot easier just to do as I was asked to do than it was to suffer the consequences of being stubborn. Now, There were things that mama asked me to do that weren't urgent. That she gave me time. She gave me space to do. But what I did learn is to to learn the urgency of the voice. Y'all with me? 
And what we got to understand today is that we've got to learn the urgency of the voice of God. That He's troubling the waters for you and I. And when He's telling us to get in the water, don't you worry about what else is in the water. You just worry about getting you in the water. You just be concerned about getting yourself in the place where the Lord wants you. The man by the pool of Bethesda, every time he tried to go, hey man, somebody always beat him to it. But one day, because of his faithfulness, the pool came to him. I want you to understand that obedience matters in our life. That when we obey the Lord, that when we call upon the name of the Lord and we trust in the name of the Lord, amen, when I can't get to the pool, the pool will come to me. When I can't get to the river, the river will come to me. Amen, when I'm unable to do what I need to do, amen, my faith will say the Lord will come to me and help me. I'm calling on this tonight. It's time for us, amen, to find out what's in the water, the waters of God. The waters that are flowing from the kingdom of God, from the throne of God. There's something in there for us, uh, amen, to encourage us, to help us, to give us the strength, to heal us, to deliver us, to make us whole. What I find is that when Naaman came out of that water, he didn't smell like the water. He didn't bear the leeches and the trash and the things that inhabited that water. But when Naaman left that dirty water, he went in with a dirty vessel and dirty water and came out clean. Who can do that but God? Who can do that for you? We were dirty vessels. And the Lord took the nearest body of water and said, just get in there and wash. It's essentially what Naaman did. I imagine when naming, it's a natural instinct. I used to, uh, when, I, when I was growing up and I was a teenager boy, it was summertime when meant pool time to me. Because I went to the pool near about every day when I was growing up. I was, a, I was a professional bicyclist or cyclist. And I could ride that three speed and I had it down to an arc. I knew how long it was going to take me to get there. And my course was so predictable. People knew when I was going to the pool, I'd have a buddy riding a motorcycle. I had me a little stick to beat dogs off, and I'd hand him the stick, and he'd pull me with his motorcycle. Huh? That's right. It was foolish, I know, but that 50 I was going was sure better than that 15 I was peddling. Huh? I didn't think about wrecking. I didn't think about losing control. All I felt, man, I ain't pedaling and that breeze feels good and I'm getting to the pool a whole lot quicker. I had people that stop. You want to ride? Throw your bicycle in the back. You want to ride? Yeah. I didn't ever tell them I was in a hurry. I don't know if y'all know Jeff Edwards or not. Jeff Edwards is the one. Them Edwards boys, they walked in Bladenburg everywhere they went. And Jeff, is he's a few light loads short of few shovel full short of a load. And Jeff was walking somewhere one day. And somebody said, Jeff, stop and said, Jeff, you want to ride? He said, no, I'm in a hurry. Yeah. So I ain't pulling your leg. No, I'm in a hurry. Okay. Gotcha. I never told nobody I was in a hurry. Man, I throwed that bicycle in the back of that truck and we rode on. I got to where I was going a whole lot quicker because I was willing to accept help. You know what? One of the biggest things in the lives of people today is our resistance to help. We don't want to be indebted to nobody. I don't want to owe nobody nothing. I don't want nobody to do nothing for me. I don't want to have to be ingratiated to nobody for nothing. And that's why we get the attitudes of nobody cares for me or nobody cares about me and blah, blah this and blah, blah that. It's because we're always turning people away. No, I don't need you. 
That's what Naaman was saying when he didn't want to go into Georgia, the Jordan River. I started to say Georgia. That muddy water in Georgia is rough too. That's what Naaman was saying. No, 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 no. I don't need that. I want this over here because it's better. Church, you don't know what God has in store for you. What may look ugly to you, it may be a treasure trove that the Lord has covered up with something else. And for Naaman, it was deliverance. For Naaman, it was healing. The pool of the Bethesda was the healing. It might not have been much to look at, but it was a source of help. I want you to know that God sends people in your life to help you. God sends people in your life to encourage you. Quit turning your help away. Quit being so proud that you can't accept a helping hand from a neighbor. They're not there to fleece you. They're not out there to get out of you what they can. They're there because they genuinely care for you and the Lord has laid a burden on their heart for you to help you. You may not even know you need the help, but God does. There's something in that water, amen, that we got to be willing to go in and get. There's something in that water that we've got to be obedient to the Spirit of God that says, Lord, this don't look good to me, but I'm going to trust you. Lord, I don't know about this, but I'm going to trust you. Right? Amen? Wasn't it Zerubbabel? The armies were coming against him. What in the world are we going to do? He said, God, I'm scared. I mean, we're not fit to face these armies. Called a fast. They prayed. God sent the prophet. And God said, here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to put your men of war at the back. And he said, I want you to put your praisers up in front. I want you to put your worshipers up in front. Isn't that the worst military advice anybody could ever receive to put unarmed men to face an armed army? But God's not a regular general. God equips his worshipers with a different armament. And they put the worshipers in front and they went in this fashion in that they praised the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And what did God do? God wrecked that enemy before they were ever there to get there. What did he do? He said, I want you to go in this river. It may not look, amen, like you want it to look. You may not feel like you're prepared. But if you'll go as I send you, you're going to win this battle. And that's all God is saying to us. That's all God was saying to Naaman. Naaman, if you'll just go where I send you, I'll give you the victory. I'll give you the help. There's something today in the Word of God. There's something today uh, in the direction of God that just tells us if if you'll obey me, I'll give you what you stand in need of. It just comes down to the basics of obedience. And it's one of the hardest things in the nature of men. Can I take a poll and you'll vote honestly tonight? I know a lot of you won't participate. Just because you won't. But how many of you like people to tell you what to do? Go ahead, lift your hand. Is there anybody in here that loves for people to tell you what to do? Ain't nobody raised their hand but me. And I was just seeing who was going to raise their hand with me. Brother David, do you really like people to tell you what to do? Do you really think that? But I got people telling me what to do all the time. I do. And so do you. You have people telling you what to do all the time. It's just how you receive it. It's how it's phrased. 
There are people that resent it. There are people that just accept it. There are people that just take it in the context of which it is given. But we, as people, have somebody that are giving us directives all the time. Do you realize that if it's hard for us to take a directive from our neighbor, it's hard for us to take a directive from God? You want me to say it one more time? If it's hard for us to take a directive from our neighbor, it's hard for us to take a directive from God because our nature's changed. Our nature is trained. To resist it. Because we ain't 100% spiritual yet. There's carnality in there. Am I right or am I wrong? And there's a resistance. And there's a will in there. (laughs) Hey I've told folks before. You can't tell me what to do. Sometimes I've said it joking. And sometimes I'll serious as a heart attack. I've had people just hit me the wrong way. I had a boss man one time trying to tell me what to do. You know what I told him? And the Lord is my witness. This is just how I said it to him. I said it before I could catch them words. They were out. I told him, I said, listen here. That's exactly what I said. Listen here. I don't need you to tell me how to do my job. I did. I looked him dead in the eyes and told him that. It was too late to take it back then. Was I right? No. I should have just took it and walked on with it. But instead of intimidating me, I intimidated him a little bit because he Well, I I, I was just talking about me. No, he wasn't. Sometimes the Lord speaks to us through other people. And we miss the message because we're focused on the messenger. Naaman got focused on everything except the message. And when Naaman received the message, Naaman received his help. Won't you understand tonight that God will help us to receive the message. That sometimes God sends us messages that are gruff. Sometimes God sends us messages that are compassionate. Sometimes God sends us messages that are straightforward. God sends us messages and messengers in all sizes, shapes, and forms. But we've got to be mindful enough of the Spirit of God to understand what the Lord is trying to say to us. There's something there. There's something in the river of God that is for us. Now, I don't know how y'all feel about this tonight because y'all all staring at me. I don't know if you're hot, tired, and ready to go home. I don't know if you were disinterested. And I don't know if we have to need a pastor vote. I don't know. But what I'm telling you tonight is this. Is that as sons and daughters of God, we have got to have the spirit of obedience. God does not esteem none of us above the other. You hear me? I'm going to say it one more time. God does not esteem any of us above the other. God has his hierarchy. God has set his hierarchy. And God is the that is the way God has intended things to be. But God loves us all the same. And he's going to give us directive to get to heaven. But obedience. What does the Bible say about obedience? And what does he say about listening? (coughs) Hearkening, I'm sorry. It's better than the fat of rams. The fat of the ram was sweet savor to God. So when we obey, it's better than offering that sacrifice. 
And when we listen, it's better than the sweet savor of the burning fat on the altar of sacrifice. So what are you saying? I'm saying that God takes pleasure in our obedience. It's so easy to get caught up and think we're doing a good job. And I'm not here tonight to tell you you're not doing good for Jesus. I'm just here to tell you tonight that it's easy to stumble and get caught up and proud of ourselves and how well we're doing and allow habits to get in the way of how we're serving the Lord and that we got to maintain our humility and we got to maintain that spirit of meekness and we got to maintain that spirit of obedience that we don't argue with God when the Lord gives us direction. There's healing. There's deliverance. And there's a testimony in listening to God. Amen. Amen. Now you can say, preacher, I'm glad you threw. Stand up. Altars are open tonight. Everyone that would like to come and pray. Amen. Let's come and pray that we can find our place in the river of God.